So let me introduce our final presenter today, uh, Guy Cortez from Synopsys. His presentation is using data analytics to debug and trace multi-chip module test failures during the manufacturing process for reducing overall test and manufacturing costs. Guy is a staff product marketing manager at Synopsys. In his career, he has held the various marketing positions for companies such as Synopsys, Cadence, VMware, and Optimal Plus. Thank you, Guy. Please go ahead. Thank you. And pleasure meeting everybody here. And thank you for joining my presentation. Uh, I want to just kind of have a kind of a kind of context setting slide that kind of uh, initializes the, you know, the issues that we're trying to convey here and what the challenges are. Um, so, so as everybody knows, right, there's the, the issues of scaling packaging in, in, in the system area when you start to go to more advanced nodes. Um, so the, the point being here is that, you know, as we're going to, to more advanced nodes, like say a three nanometer, for example, as some, some uh, companies are going towards and even more aggressive, um, you know, they're counting, of course, the, the traditional uh, issues, right, as you go to, to more, you know, design, larger designs, uh, higher capacity, and transistor density, and so on. Uh, the, the key point I want to mention, though, is that, you know, the traditional tools that have been used, you know, to solve a lot of the same problems, you know, are kind of uh, not necessarily being able to address some of the these issues anymore, basically because of the raw amounts of data that's going to be produced now. Uh, you know, we hear, like, there's orders of magnitude more data as you go to, like, three nanometers, for example. So consequently, uh, like a solution that includes uh, data analytics is really becoming not just a nice to have, it's really becoming really critical and it's almost mandatory now in order to help find those needle in a haystack types of issues. Right? So at Synopsys, you know, we have a Silicon Lab cycle management platform called Silicon Max uh, that basically enables uh, engineers the ability to monitor the health and performance of their chip across the different stages of manufacturing or the stages of life, starting from in design through manufacturing uh, with, within ramp and production and finally in the field. You know, and so you know, we have the ability now with data analytics and with the engines to make sure that you know, as we start to migrate through from in design and ramp and production and field, that we're gathering the data that we need to, we're monitoring everything. But you know, more than just monitoring the, the health and the uh, performance, right? There's also abilities now to be able to affect, you know, what we can do, like the, we can improve the silicon operational metrics, for example, in terms of power or timing uh, by, by way of just collecting the data and doing all the analytics on them. So there's ability to, to take the data and feedback and to improve the processes along the way uh, at any stage here. Uh, so it's, it's uh, intended to be this kind of a closed loop thing where you can start off, uh, you know, in design, you start to produce your silicon. Uh, there's also connections back into design to help you with kind of looking at, you know, what your margins are looking at. And if you want to be able to be less pessimistic, now you have real silicon, you can send the data back into design world and do the, and do the analysis there and say, oh, you know what, uh, you know, we have the ability to go faster or in certain areas, we don't need to be as pessimistic. Is this an example, right? So those are ways that we can improve, right, the design along the way, in addition to just monitoring the health and performance along the way. And so there's different facets of the whole process, starting with sensors as a, as a way to gather data. And so we have a whole host of uh, solution around process voltage and temperature uh, monitors and sensors that we offer. Uh, there's also uh, upcoming new IP like for path uh, delay, for example, monitors to help you really uh, zone in on specific areas of the design that are critical for timing. And then so the monitors are helping to identify issues there. And then the data, of course, we collect all, all along across the entire uh, life cycle and uh, do analytics along the way. Um, and so what we want to kind of highlight here is that, you know, there's different areas of focus that we have. And for the interest of time, you know, what we're focusing on for this presentation is more on the in, in production side of things, right? Because this is the part where you already have your design, you already have manufactured it. You've gone through some level of ramp where, you know, you kind of gone through initial, um, you know, yield issues that you maybe basically solved and now you're ready to go to in production. Now, now in production, now you're gonna to start to encounter some issues. And this is kind of what we're gonna show here as an example of what can happen. And then, you know, what would be your, uh, the resolution to solve these problems as you counter problems more towards in the production side of things. 
Okay. And the technology that uh, one of the foundational technologies in Silicon Max is called Silicon Dash. And this is going to be the technology that we're going to primarily focus on in this uh, example here. So as a quick overview, um, if you haven't heard about Silicon Dash, really what it is, is it's really a high volume big data analytics uh, solution. And it's mainly helps the fabulous companies in the world, uh, IDMs. Uh, it can also help with OSATs, those companies that are doing the majority of the testing of the chips and also foundries. Um, you know, there's a whole host of, um, of collateral you can find in Silicon Dash. In fact, uh, one easy way to remember, you know, we talked about SLM or Silicon Lifecycle Management. If you simply go to synopsis.com, right, www.synopsis.com slash SLM for Silicon Lifecycle Management, um, it will bring you to a page there that has all the foundational technologies, including Silicon Dash. And there you'll find uh, videos, demos, uh, data sheets, all that good stuff. Uh, but in short, um, it, it addresses you know quality management, throughput management, operations management, including a yield for your ICs and your MCMs. Okay, and to go a little bit further in terms of the benefits, we'll kind of go through this fairly quickly, and then we'll cut to the to the example specifically. So the key th one of the key things that Silicon Dash provides is is called end to end traceability across the manufacturing chain. And part of that is by way of uh, capturing the electronic chip ID information. So every, every uh, almost almost every silicon, almost every chip has an ESID, electronic chip ID associated with it. So we leverage that uh, in order to kind of keep track of where the process or where that die is along the way. Um, and so that's gonna be a really key part of what we're gonna be showing here is this ability of, of doing traceability. That's the whole uh, uh, key to be able to find the source of the problem early on in terms of the manufacturing side. Okay, so that's something that we'll talk about uh, quite extensively here. But uh, one of the things that Silicon also does, you know, once we have the ability to trace everything, of course, we need to do all the data collection and all the data preparation. preparation. So that's part of actually what we offer in Silicon Dash. It's a software as a service model. And so as part of that, uh, we enable uh, all the collection and we handle all that for our customers. And it could be as shown here, right? You see here, we have uh, through manufacturing data, through the wafer test, assembly, final test, beta system. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of data. And, and most times than not, customers who try to do a lot of this by themselves, it's, it's just a big problem to solve. Uh, as you can imagine, just the raw amount of data alone is, is massive, but also, you know, you think about how do you normalize data as they come through? There's different types of tests that are being done. You need to normalize it. You also need to align all the data to make sure that, you know, you know which die is coming from which wafer and which lot. So all that, it takes a lot of um, know-how. And so customers, if they try to do some of this, uh, they may try to do it and maybe only 10% of the data comes through. So what we try to offload customers is to say, okay, we can handle all that data for you. And we make sure that uh, at least 99% of it is all consumed, right? Uh, with very low false positives. Um, in addition to that, so the first time customers really get to, to do anything is during this visualization phase down below. And uh, we have something called insights. And that's what uh, customers are used to seeing is basically is as data starts to funnel through 24 seven, basically out of the box, um, all customers need to do is log into their system and they see all their data, all, all their, um, their product data, all the test data that they have for their products. And then the nice thing about uh, Silicon Dash is that we have, to, again, this insights tells you exactly what the source of the problem is, tells you, you know, key things that are that they're that may be troublesome that you need to look into. So it does all these automatic analytics for you. So there's no special querying, there's no manual manipulation of any data sets that you need to worry about. Simply put, you have all these insights shown to you right out of the box. And it helps you within a matter of a few clicks, you can do root cause analysis on problems. Whereby in other solutions, it may take you upwards of days or weeks in order to find something because you need to dig through the data yourself first in order to find something of interest. And then more than, uh, more than just doing the analysis itself, uh, one of the key things for Slinka Dash is now you wanna go ahead and do some corrective action. So once you do the, all the analysis, the next logical thing is to do is what they call production control. 
is now let's say you find an issue that's going on in the data and manufacturing, but you want, let's say you want to send a message back into the manufacturing chain, say, you know, there's an issue with, with regards to maybe something with regards to maybe yield uh, or quality issue that you may have within your ICs that uh, you, let's say you want to bin out certain types of dyes that are, you think are problematic, that maybe they're outliers, they're passing today, but you think they might be problematic later on if you get put into the system, into the final product. So you can influence the tool that way. You can go ahead and send those instructions back into manufacturing. And therefore, at that point, um, you can make the changes you, you want to have done in the manufacturing side. So that's the production control side of things. And, and a couple of things to, to note with the insights is that, um, as you see here, uh, there's what they call um, the distribution tails uh, in the middle. That's basically a case where you have a narrow uh, spec limit and then you're falling, you see some fallout on the bottom left. That means that those parts, those dyes that are indicating down here are failing. Um, and so this could be a case where, you know, it could be legitimate if it's a, if it's a high, you know, highly quality sensitive type of product, you might want to do that. You might want to make these, you know, make it really rigid. And so only the best dyes are being passed through. Um, but if you want to extend that or you say, no, these parts are probably pretty good, you can do a simulation. You can click and drag uh, the boundary of the spec limit to the left. It'll tell you real time, you know, how much more yield you can get. Um, on the top right, it's a, it's a case where the inside is showing you that you have an opposite case where you have wide test limits where everything is passing. And then you start to see a tail on the top right now. These are what they call outliers where, you know, they're not testing the same as the majority of all the dyes. So there's something uniquely different about them. They might be okay, but if you're again, sensitive to quality, uh, you can also do the opposite. You can click and drag a boundary on the right uh, spec limit and bring it to the left, and then you'll tell you what your fallout's going to be. You know how much how much dye you're going to lose uh, by doing that. So you need to do that trade-off between quality and yield to see what's best for you, right? And and depending on the application, um, it can make a big difference. The bottom examples we're not really going to go a lot of detail. Just basically highlighting, you know, sometimes test equipment can go out of calibration, which you know, which is a common thing, right? So, or there's an issue with, thing, let's say, with a certain element within the test equipment uh, that's failed. Um, so that could be causing uh, the parts to fail. So if you didn't have the analytics or insights to tell you that, you know, your parts are failing and you're throwing away good parts. But in fact, it's really due to the equipment that's maybe out of calibration that's causing um, the equipment, to, uh, causing the parts to fail. And then the last example on the top top left, we're going to cover that now. So we're going to just go into the example, and it, it, we're going to rely heavily on correlation, which is the ability to go ahead and uh, uh, you know correlate any test to any test along the entire spectrum of the whole life cycle of the chip. Okay, so um, multi-chip modules and chiplets, you know, they pose unique challenges, and the challenges are somewhat intuitive if you kind of think about it. You know, for example, if you now have a package that has multiple dyes in it, uh, it only takes one die for the whole package to fail. So consequently, it's really imperative that, you know, you want to have high quality dyes, of course, in order to make sure that your packages, uh, once you assemble them, um, they, they will pass, right? The other, you know, challenge, of course, is that if you go to the process where you get into a stage. Um, so as you, as you, we kind of highlighting here, if you don't know what these acronyms mean, so I'll kind of just kind of quickly cover that. So what is wafer acceptance test? So that's the data coming from, from the foundry. Certain data that we can actually bring in to, to in order to help us to uh, refine our analytics. Uh, bump is, you know, the ability to the solder, the solder balls that are put onto the uh, to the silicon there, you know, we do testing around that. Uh, WS is, is uh, basically wafer sort. That's all the parametric tests that are done. Uh, ASSY is basically the assembly phase and FT is final test and SLT is system level test. So once it goes through assembly and gets packaged, let's say you're going into final test now and you start to encounter issues, that's when, um, you know, you need to start to do some uh, corrective action. And ideally, you know, what you want to make sure is you know, you want to make sure that you have a way of tracing the data all the way back. So the ideal goal is to, if you're counting, a, you're countering a downstream issue, you want to find if there's an upstream parameter somewhere upstream that can predict the failures that you're now encountering 
downstream. That's the whole goal. And again, we use the ESIDs for that. You know, if you don't have any ESIDs, sometimes we use the 2D barcodes that are etched into the substrate as the ability to kind of trace uh, silicon along the way. Okay. So the example uh, scenario here, as we show it, is that a customer is, has a four die MCM package. They're encountering some issue down in the final test area. And so their issues are kind of associated, you know, as we show here, if you look at the different types of bin, the fail bins, the functional test is really the, the key predominant area for what's failing. And, in, and the color codes are important because you're gonna to start to notice in the next couple of slides, as we start looking at wafer maps, for example, um, the color codes are gonna come into play. So the orange is what you wanna focus in on in the next couple of slides. Those are the, that's the one that uh, we're gonna be tracing through because that's where predominantly where a lot of the failed uh, tests are coming from, okay? And it's a uh, bin six in this example. So one of the things that you, when we start to look for initially say, you know, is there any, what do we call a geospatial relationship between what we're seeing in terms of the failures and, and the location of where the dyes originated from and the wafers? You know, back, back in wafer sort, for example, before they even got cut up and put into their own packages, you know, is there something upstream that we can look to see if there's a pattern that can, uh, you know, tell us, hey, yeah, you're having an issue uh, upstream that can identify a problem downstream. So if you take a look at this now, it looks like there is a, there is a pattern, right? Because the orange color, are there all those failed dyes from that functional bin six test? And you notice that majority of them are kind of grouped in the middle here in the center. So it's a kind of like a, a typical center wafer uh, cut, you know, type of view. Um, but in order to get this view, what we actually did is, you know, we take all the failed tests, all the dyes, and we superimpose them back to where their location was back in wafer sort. So these are where they actually were located before they got, you know, cut up and put into their own packages, right? So it's, uh, this is an ability that we can do, we can superimpose it back onto the wafer sort. The other interesting thing that you need to, to notice here is that um, the four dyes that are make up the packages, they actually, the, the, the company that did this actually used a, a kind of a geospatial kind of methodology too. They took, you know, if you can see here, four dyes that are in the relative same area and they kind of use those dyes to put into package. You know, that, that may not be a, that much relevance here, but, you know, there is going to be a conclusion that we're going to be you know, talking about later on. That kind of that kind of refers to this location, the cause, you know, location-based uh, selection process. So keep that in mind. Um, but the other thing I want to highlight for you is like the gray color that you notice that's surrounding the orange. The gray colors is is indicative of something going on that's uh, that suggests that okay, gray meaning that this hasn't been tested yet. You know, the dyes haven't been either test tested yet uh, in these packages, and maybe that they're they're going to be tested later on or you know, as we're going to talk about in the next slide, get the more clarity of that. It could be that these these dyes that are in gray that are, that are not tested yet could be maybe in part of a different package. Because keep in mind, this is the wafer that's showing the four dye package variant. There could be a six dye version or an eight dye version, and maybe that's why they're not in this wafer view. Or they could have failed, right? So, you know, that's one thing that we want to look at, right? As we talked about here, the gray color we talked about. So it looks like a classic good die, bad neighborhood. But what we want to do is now is we want to take a look, closer look at the wafer sort test. Let's, let's do a, a complete view of what happened during wafer sort on this wafer. So we have a collective view just to make sure that, you know, if we do think it's a the classic, you know, good die, bad neighborhood or cluster problem, you know, then the wafer sort map, uh, all the tests superimposed should tell us if that's true. So taking a look now at a composite view of that same wafer. Now, the color code uh, you're seeing here is that the white is indicative of a past test. So the dyes throughout all the wafer sort that's shown to be white means that they actually, they actually passed. So here our assumption that, okay, there's some kind of a good data by neighborhood or cluster problem is not really true. The assumption is, is not accurate. Right? Why? Because these parts actually passed. So why you have all the gray color then? You know, the gray color really may, basically means that 
that the previous in the previous map is that those parts that you know that were gray, that maybe they didn't get tested yet. You know, they were part of the four die package, but they didn't get tested yet, or they're part of a different package altogether, a different MCM product altogether. So that's the reason. So we don't really have a root cause yet, right? We're still kind of thinking, well, you know, what, what can we do now? You know, how can we try to find the source of the problem? So, you know, looking further now, we say, okay, we can use our correlation capabilities, which is the ability to kind of test or look at all the tests that was ever done on any given die and correlate it on each other and to see, okay, is there a pattern that can predict what's going on in final tests. Is there a pattern in any particular test early on during uh, the manufacturing that can actually predict what we're seeing? And so when we do the correlation, it's basically a push button you know, uh, mode within Silicon Dash. You say, I wanna correlate everything to everything. And then it comes back and says, you know, we found a possible match for you. On the left is the same wafer map that you'd seen before. On the, on the right is basically a, what they call a leakage it's a leakage test, right? Leakage current test that we were able to find that matches the same kind of a center mapping, a center, uh, you know, die type of issue. And furthermore, what it tends to give you is you started looking into it, does the correlation, it basically maps the final test, dies that are in final test and how they actually tested during wafer sort. So now the color code comes into play again. You can see like, the orange color, where again, were the ones that were predominantly failing the final test. If you start looking at where they're located in terms of the leakage current test, you see that there is a faint uh, orange line uh, near the zero mark. In this particular example, the actual wafer sort leakage current test actually ranged between zero milliamps and 16 milliamps. So that's kind of what um, that was the full range. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't any, any anything more narrow than that. So consequently, anything close to zero is going to be passing in wafer sort. And then later on, as we notice in final tests, it's it's failing a final test probably due to performance, right? So what what are some of the conclusions that we can say here? Well, one thing for sure is like you know on the mapping, the color scheme is indicative of a what they call a cold center, right? The black color and the dark blue color is basically saying you have a slow performing center. And as you start to radially go outside of the center towards the outer rim, you start to go into a faster, more, uh, warmer temperature as they call. Uh, so basically from a performance standpoint, it's slower in the center and it's faster on the outside. And of course, depending on the application, you need to do your classic you know, uh, power um, you know, performance type of analysis, right, to see okay, do I want to um, go with a, a slower performing part, but it actually has longer battery life, or do I want to go with a faster performing part and that may actually have a slower, uh, lower battery life. So, um, so that's, that's up to the customer, right? So they have to decide all that and kind of where their sweet spot is for their application. But moreover, you know, in this particular case, one, one potential, potential corrective action could be to lower the lower limit or raise the lower limit, excuse me, from zero to somewhere to the right. So maybe either 0.5 milliamps or somewhere along those uh, areas. What that would do is if you move the limit on this particular test, it's gonna catch all those that are at the zero mark. You know, but obviously there's some other parts that are still passing. So, you know, again, it's, it's a classic, again, you need to see how much trade-off you're willing to accept uh, of, you know, of good dyes, you know, these are passing parts, but, you know, if they're too slow for you, then obviously you can bend them out earlier. So again, that's the trade-off you need to make between yield and, and the quality of the parts, right? Um, one last point I wanna make here too, is that uh, this was just one wafer. So normally you would not make this type of decision just on one wafer alone. You know, what you wanna do is at this point is look at maybe a whole lot worth, right? So there's typically 25 wafers in one lot. You're gonna look at an entire lot to see if this is predominantly the case for throughout all the wafers. And if it is, then yes, you know, um, you can go ahead and make that decision and how you want to uh, modify it. Okay. 
So finally, as far as some considerations that we want to talk about, recall that I, I showed you that this a particular company chose to pick the MCMs or pick the dyes that go within their MCMs within the area of the wafer, right? Um, so consequently, um, you're not really are leveraging the top performing dyes per se or the highest quality ones. You're just picking based on where they are located on the wafer. All right, so therefore, if it's a weak dye, one of the weak dyes there, uh, you know, your performance and quality is gonna be driven by that one dye. So one concept is to do more an intelligent grouping. Uh, now that you have you know, all the wafer sort data, you have plenty of all information you can do the analytics on, we can actually pick uh, more intelligently and group those, um, those dyes in a package based on performance, for example. Those that are highest performing dye, you may be able to group them together and, and offer a premium for specific, uh, you can bin those into specific bins for high performing parts. Uh, same for quality, you know, if you want to have the most solid, uh, you know, ICs or, or, or dyes, you wanna go ahead and you pick those dyes that are maybe that are at center of the histogram of the testing, right? Those are right in the dead center. Uh, therefore, they're the highest quality ones. And again, you can then, you can then group those and together in uh, like versus like into the same package and offer those as a premium. You know, so Silicon Dash, uh, you know, that's gonna be like a next generation capabilities that we're gonna to look to do. Uh, but today customers who had that kind of bias process can also influence the tool and provide their own scripting in doing that. So that was my presentation. Um, I think we can turn it back over to, I guess, Q and A. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was very interesting. Um, Guy, so do you have one of the questions? Is do you have a, both a cloud and an on-premises offering with your with your tools? Uh, yes, actually, we do. In fact, uh, we have most of our customers use uh, our third-party cloud uh, offering that we offer. Um, and the reason why is because they don't necessarily want to manage all the data themselves, and uh, they want us to go ahead and take care of all the the, the data management and the storing of the data. Right. Uh, we have also have customers that do on-prem as well, which is they have to have their own server um, and they do their I see. own I see. Yeah, okay. collection. Thank you. Yeah. And one, one general question came in from Anne Meixner. Hi, Anne. Um, it's a general mm -hmm. question for all speakers. Data analytics across the supply chain has made significant progress for IC devices. Where are we in terms of providing feedback to the packaging substrate? Well, I mean, we also are working on the assembly side too. So one of the newer developments for analytics is in the assembly side. And so we're starting working with the companies, uh, the developers uh, of the packaging companies that do all that work. And so we do offer uh, today, we do have the ability to do a, what they call assembly uh, analytics where that feedback path that work together with the assembly uh, providers. Um, so that's something that's fairly new, but it's something that we actually are one of the, uh, one of the first ones in the market in this industry to be able to provide that kind of capability right. for assembly. What sort of parameters are you looking at for assembly? Um, you know, well, this is something that, uh, you know, we're still, we're still investigating a little bit, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we can get back in more details on that. Okay. okay. Very good. Cool. Thing. I think that was the end of the questions. Um, thank you very much, Guy, for a great presentation. I'd like to thank all the presenters who uh, presented today. And I also want to give an extra special thank you to all the sponsors who made this event possible. Our diamond sponsor is Omcor with differentiators in technology, quality, and service. Our emerald sponsors are uh, Adventist, uh, rated number one in the VLSI uh, research for ATE uh, survey, a synopsis uh, from silicon to software, and our Ruby sponsor, uh, Tech Search International. So I'd like to thank all of them once again for making this event possible. I'd like to thank all of you for attending and look forward to seeing everybody here back again tomorrow. So thank you and have a good rest of your day. <laughs>